welcome back to Winning Through Culture. So as summer kicks into high gear, we thought it'd be a great opportunity to take a step back and reflect on some of the greatest hits through our Winning Through Culture episode history. In this Greatest Hits episode featuring Rob McKenna, he focuses on what culture really means to him and how you as a leader impact the culture in really four key areas. So how you're approaching your daily life impacts the we, how we do things is really how he focuses on culture and the definition. As we think about what's happened and progressed over the last three years, I hope you find this episode impactful and relevant. I am here today with Rob McKinnon. Rob is the founder of McKinnon Leadership Group. He also has a podcast of his own, Five O'Clock Leadership. I strongly recommend you to check that out. And his upcoming book to be released Labor Day weekend is Lead Like You Were Meant To, Making the Switch from Autopilot to Intentional. Rob, thanks for being with us today. Fun to be with you, Tim. It's good to be together. Rob and I, I'm going to just tell a little bit of the history you and I have together. So Rob and I have known each other for 20, 21 years. We worked together in the financial services industry. And Rob also is uh, one person I point to that kind of reoriented me back on my faith journey when I was in my early 30s. And uh, we'll forever be grateful for that. But good friend. Good friend. Great mentor and a great leader. So I'm excited to jump into our conversation today, Rob, specific to the focus of our podcast, Winning Through Culture. And I know you work with a lot of CEOs, a lot of executive leadership teams. You've been, as we've discussed offline, you've been really going hard like everyone else, helping everybody deal with this COVID-19 situation and do the best they can to both lean on the cultures they've created, in some cases maybe recreate their culture in this new environment, and then just be the best leaders they can. So today we're really going to spend some time diving into those topics and hear it firsthand from both your experiences during this time, the history of you know, your decade plus now of coaching other leaders and training other leaders to build businesses of excellence. So why don't we start, Rob, if we could. I shared obviously a little bit about who you are, but do you want to tell us a little bit about your story and how you came to where you are today? Sure. First of all, Tim, you know, it's just a delight to be doing this with you. I appreciate the history of our friendship. It spans the decades, really, and uh, just appreciate the deep foundation that we formed years ago that has enabled us to just engage here, even after the passage of some time, and kind of pick right back up where we left off. I think it speaks to having good friends in your life. And I'm grateful for you and right back at you in terms of being a mentor an advisor, and being a great leader yourself, brother. Just so, again, I'm probably one of the few people that has a perspective on the span of your life and your track vocationally, and just love seeing you where you are today and having the impact, the leadership impact you're having. And I love your emphasis on culture. I'm in the leadership space, of course, and I consider culture leverage for leadership especially as an organization grows and the leader loses his or her ability to touch every person in the organization, the way you do that is through culture. So Tim, I, hats off to you for putting an emphasis on that and, and having this podcast. So I've been doing this for about 15 years, and I think you would probably agree as a longtime friend of mine, this is, I certainly feel like this is the space I belong in, walking alongside leaders like you and helping them be their best. About five years ago, I maxed out on my capacity in working with leaders, coaching them, because inevitably we'd start the coaching process, and thankfully, they got enough out of it that they'd want that for their whole team. So I took a risk and had some other coaches that took a risk with me and trained them in our process. We now just simply call it the McKinnon way of leadership coaching. And so we're just growing. We got a little boutique coaching firm. We feel pretty good about the work that we do and the impact we have with leaders. And where I really care about that, just like you care about culture, is if we can have a positive impact with the leaders we work with, then again, that's our leverage of impacting all the people that they lead and influence. You've had 15 years, as you said, 
coming alongside leaders. And I love your concept, Rob, of culture is leadership leverage. Maybe you can expand on that and kind of how you came to experience that, understand that, and then how you're helping leaders use that leverage to touch their people and to grow their organizations successfully. Yeah, well, it's certainly something like, and again, not to shamelessly plug it, but the wording is very significant. But the subtitle of my book, Making the Shift from Autopilot to Intentional, leaders have to be intentional about things like culture. You have a culture. Every place has a culture. You did build it. It's just a matter if it's the one you want. Right. That's the key question. Is it the culture you want? My favorite way of referring to culture or definition of it is how we do things around here. How does that strike you when I offer that as a, my little definition? Well, it's a great, simple way to understand it because uh, one of the things I do on this podcast is ask people their definition of culture. And it can be an elusive word to describe, but I think how we do things around here really does encapsulate it very succinctly. And I like that. I'm holding on to that one. So. Yeah. So I'll come back to that in a moment because, I mean, I think you just start saying, well, our company doesn't do it that way. Or our company always does it this way. We don't allow that here. We always pursue fill in the blank. The key word there is we. And so the leader can uh, have best intentions about what they want the company to represent. But that's singular first person, me, I. And if that doesn't get translated into we, then it's probably not the culture that the leader wants. So there has to be a real intentionality about it. You know, another picture I use for it is it's the fishbowl we're all swimming in. And we're swimming in the water and we're circling around one another and we're eating together and we're playing together and we're hopefully working together but we're swimming in the same water. And so what are the implications of that in terms of how we collectively are showing up and doing our work? I think you're right. I mean, how appropriate the timing of focusing on culture right as we go into this pandemic, because I would tend to say, you know, our culture shows up in the snack room. It shows up around the, I don't think we have many of these anymore, but the proverbial water cooler. It's everything. It's coffee machine. (laughs) Yeah, the coffee machine. Okay. So it's the conversations. It's the little back and forth. It's the larger formal presentations. But it's, again, it just comes back to how we're doing things around here. And the craziness of thinking about culture at a time when we're all isolated, I don't know, that can flip your brain around in circles to try to talk about what culture would be during a pandemic, don't you think? Yeah, I mean, I, let's dive into that a little bit deeper, Rob, because I think ultimately I've shared a little bit on this previous podcast, the history of how I came to actually start this podcast, which was about four years ago in my C12 group. I finally realized from a business perspective, so many things are being commoditized. And the one thing that you know, really can't be commoditized and really is a unique reflection of your organization is culture. And I knew I had one, there were elements of it I didn't like, and I knew I had not attended to it or been intentional about it. And so I got serious about that, which again, led to the beginning of this podcast, even before the COVID-19 situation, we actually recorded several episodes we haven't used yet because they just would have been tone deaf (laughs) for the moment. So we'll see if we ever dust those off for the future. But the thing that really, in my mind, has revealed itself in this pandemic is the culture of all organizations and communities is being very much revealed in the midst of a crisis. And if you weren't sure what your culture was before, you do know what it is now. And I'm curious to hear what you're seeing as it relates to that. Well, I like that word reveal. And if I've heard the phrase once, I've heard it a dozen times over the last few weeks. But this Again, we are referring to this as a crisis. It is a crisis. Never before have we had such a collective crisis where we're all experiencing it. You know, 9-11 was something that a subset of us were terrorized by in places like Washington and New York and Pennsylvania. But here, we're all susceptible to this. And 
one thing I keep hearing is this has revealed, this reveals a lot. It separates the winners from the losers. It separates the valuable people from the less valuable people. I'm talking about in terms of work contribution, everyone's valuable, but in terms of contributing to the work at hand, it separates those who are problem solvers from those who are not problem solvers. So it's the Warren Buffett saying of when the tide goes out, you see who's been swimming naked. And so it reveals all of that. Tim, when I was thinking about this and thinking about joining you, I was doing a little bit of a gut check of, okay, what am I observing? And what's interesting to me, when we talk about it has revealed what was already there, our team was slated to begin a major engagement with a large public company whose name you would know. This company is one of the top 10 best places to work for in the world. I'll simply say that. And I was scheduled to go to their location along with my partner, Brad, and we were going to do a four-hour workshop on leadership. And then that was going to be followed by extensive coaching by four members of our team with about 25 leaders in this organization. And as we approached it, gradually travel got shut down. Gradually, they made the decision to isolate in place. And then by the day of the workshop, states from California to New York had ordered everyone to stay in place. And so, first of all, I'm confronted with, boy, I have a four-hour workshop. And this workshop, I mean, we go... This is not surfacey kind of stuff in this workshop, and you rely on being in person. And so I suddenly had to use the mode we're using here of Zoom to deliver this workshop. Oh, and then our coaching, much of which is done in person, but not all of it, all needed to be done by Zoom. What was interesting about this team coming out of this organization that's one of the best places to work for, i.e., great culture, right? Yeah. You had a guy who was isolated in his bedroom in San Francisco, and San Francisco is one of the first places to say nobody's going anywhere. You had another one in his bedroom in New York City, and all 25, 26 of them displayed across the screen, all sort of managing where they were. But you know what? The team leader, I think it was around uh, St. Patrick's Day, the team leader had sent out green t-shirts to everybody in advance. Most of them were wearing those t-shirts. Some of them were coming to it with funny backgrounds. This was in the early days. This was before people had figured out you could do a virtual background with Zoom. Zoom background. (laughs) Yeah. And their engagement level was phenomenal. I mean, I felt the burden of carrying this workshop for four hours, but I could not have done it without their attention and engagement. And so what really got revealed there in terms of their culture is they were fired up. They were engaged. They were all in. They were willing to open up with one another. And it just made the workshop go so well. I don't brag on myself, but I mean, the feedback from them was it was great. Our subsequent coaching engagements were great. And so that great culture of one of these great places to work with got revealed in isolation that it was still great. And we have been coaching them over the subsequent weeks, and there's been no let up in that. I mean, they just continue to be doing well, even as they're in isolation. That's interesting, because in essence, the culture they had, which made them the best places to work, is sustaining them through this period, even though everyone is not together and is remote. You know, what about companies that might not have had the kind of culture that could sustain them that way? Are there things that you have coach to or come across that people can look to do in this period of isolation and physical distancing time? Yeah, well, I think it starts with the leaders. And I want to talk about that more in just a moment, but it starts with the leaders. But the first notion that I think people are finally getting their heads around, I was talking about this early on, is do not long for a return to normal. There is not going to be a return to normal as we knew it. We are adaptive creatures. People are adapting. And so there will be a new normal. Now, hopefully, depending on how much you want, you know, 50 to 70% of that will be similar to the old normal, but there's going to be a lot that's new normal. So I encourage leaders, treat this as an opportunity. It's a new day. If you didn't have a great culture before, you've got a new setting now to operate in and try to impact and have a 
better culture going forward. And oh, by the way, when you are able to come back together and meet physically in whatever form that takes place, that's going to make it even better when you're able to do that. You know, what comes up for me is, is I think leaders have to start with, and that's just where I start, Tim, is leaders, because they're the ones that through intentionality are going to make this happen. Leaders have got to just be asking some key questions right now. First of all, just to assess where are we? Where are we with our culture? And, you know, I've got some sample questions here I would reference, but the broad question is, how are we doing? How are we doing? Answer that question. You could ask this of all your team members. How are we doing? And get a free flow of answers. It'd be better. It's always good if you're actually thinking about doing this to have people write down their answers first so that you get their original thinking and not group think if you're talking about it as a group. Otherwise, you could do this in just a survey form. How are we staying in touch? How are we getting work done? How are we holding one another accountable? How are we communicating with one another? You notice the common phrase in there is, how are we? And then you just add on to it any leadership attribute you want to, and you're taking a measure of what your current culture is as everybody's separated and in isolation. You know, a lot of the better firms use engagement surveys for this kind of thing. They do those once a year, and they're very extensive, and there's some good ones out there. But do your own culture engagement survey by asking some of these questions. Ask people to rate each of the areas you want to look at on a scale of one to 10, and then give some explanation for their answer. And that's where leaders have to just start with where you are, start with what's unique about your particular organization, and do an assessment. And then from that, you're going to know how to begin making some tweaks and adjustments to grow your culture during this unique time. Very well said that how are we is a great reminder that we're a team and a really nice check-in question. As I think about, you know, talking about leadership, Rob, in particular, beyond the team itself, but the leader, what are you counseling, coaching your leaders to right now? I mean, your, your upcoming book, Lead Like You Were Meant To, I know it's all about intentionality, so that's clearly got to be a part of it. But what's your advice to leaders right now as far as where they need to focus on themselves? Yeah, definitely. It does start with focusing on themselves. And then I'll give you a couple of closing thoughts on key items they need to be focused on with their team. But it starts with their self. It starts, that's why my book is all about the leader and self leadership. If you can't be leading yourself right now, you're not going to lead your team well. What do we mean by that? I mean, you know, most leaders listening to this are probably saying, well, I'm doing the best I can. I feel like I'm doing a pretty good job, but we can get more specific about that. And that's what we do in our coaching. We drill down. We take this big amorphous question and break it down into smaller parts. And what I want to emphasize here on self-leadership, this is really important, is this is the stuff you can control. Why does that matter? Because we're in a pandemic, we cannot control. We cannot control where the virus goes. We can do a lot to manage that, but we can't control how people are reacting to it. We can influence that, but we can't control it. We certainly can't control when the governor in our jurisdiction or the mayor or whoever is going to say, you can go back to work and assemble. All these things that we can't control. And that's what's wigging all of us out. There's so (laughs) much that's beyond our control. So guess what? And this is what I say all the time. Redirect your attention to what you can control, which starts with you. You have 100% control over you. And I'll break that down into four key areas. Again, this is the self-leadership that we talk about in my book, Lead Like You Were Meant To. Four dimensions. We're all showing up in four dimensions. Physical, intellectual, emotional, and spiritual. So let me give you some quick examples. Physical. What are you doing to get off your butt and get outside or in your apartment in New York City. You can do this anywhere. You can break a sweat. You can stretch. You can raise your heart rate by, I don't know, do jumping jacks for five minutes. Any of that, yeah, for CrossFit and guys like you, Tim, do 100 burpees. Rest one minute, repeat. 
but we have control over that. But more in the physical, push away from the freaking desk. This is a big problem. I'm hearing reports of people Zooming for eight and nine hours. Talking on the phone for eight or nine hours is one thing, and that's too much. Zooming is another whole level. It's just wearing people out. Have yeah. boundaries. Push back. Call it off at six o'clock. Don't go back to the desk till eight o'clock the next morning. Just because you can work all the time, you are out of control if you are working all the time. So manage that. Manage what you're eating. Manage what you're drinking. It's not every night is five o'clock somewhere. I mean, leaders are talking about this. I'm gaining weight. I'm eating too much of the wrong things. I'm drinking too much of the wrong things. So all of that is absolutely in your control. Manage that intellectually, self-control, manage your thoughts. Manage your news consumption. Manage your freaking news consumption. Absolutely. Those feed your thoughts. I get my briefing in the morning. I review a couple of my trusted actual news sources that I consider valid news. I get the update. I might get one more update at the end of the day to just kind of see what happened. And then I turn it off. I had to do this. I caught myself two weeks into the pandemic. I'm like checking the news as I'm you know, about to go to bed. No, don't do that. So you can manage your thoughts. You can manage how you're thinking about things. And notice, are your thoughts skewing negative about yourself, about your people, about your ability to get your job done? Or are they skewing positive? We can do this. We're going to try some new things. We're going to do this. Emotional. Again, we talk about this extensively. Too long for a brief podcast like this. Emotions are not good or bad. What's good or bad about emotions is whether they are controlling you or, one, you are noticing them. Most leaders don't even notice the impact their emotions are having. They're too much on autopilot. And if you can notice them, you can manage them. All right? I'm a guy that my instinct is to be fearful. Fearful is about the future. And as I've worked on this over time, I've learned to say, Rob, you don't have to be so fearful about stuff that's a week or two out. Nothing's happening different right now that's threatening you. So, you know, your anger, notice your anger, channel that anger in constructive directions to do things with excellence, to do the right thing, to, you know, to work hard, but don't let your emotions manage you. And then the spiritual dimension is that deep inner dimension in, inside all of us, regardless of where you are with religion, I'm talking spiritual, is your sense of self. Who am I during this time? What kind of leader do I want to be known as during this time? Do I want to be known as one who's shrinking back and, and uncertain or wigged out and freaking everybody else out? Or do I want to be seen as steady, strong, calm? That's in that inner spiritual dimension of how I see myself and my purpose in this moment. And so those four dimensions, again, we talk about this a lot on our podcast. If people want to reference some of those, we have information on our website. And definitely the book is going to be the most complete explanation of these kinds of things. That's fantastic. I mean, those are uh, clearly within the realm of things you can control, starting with attending to yourself is the beginning of creating any great culture because you can't, to your point, lead others if you cannot lead yourself. And on that vein, so I am a leader that has taken care of myself. I'm taking care of these dimensions of my life and I'm being intentional about the type of culture I have. What are some of the things you're coaching and giving advice to leaders on as far as how they can attend to others in the creation of their well-being and the culture overall of your organization. Exactly. And this is the role of leadership. And aren't people looking for leadership right now? I mean, it's our leaders at the national level, the state level, and otherwise, and healthcare leaders. So absolutely, if you're a leader, people are looking to you for direction, whether they express that or not. And there's a lot of different things. Obviously, each of the different CEOs and leaders that that I coach and that our team coaches, they have their own unique things. But I will tell you two threads that come through that, that find ourselves repeating all the time. Uh, number one, leaders of all people need to have a vision for tomorrow. 
And why is that so important right now? Because people are looking at their present and they're looking at where they are today or they're looking at the past few weeks and it just kind of sucks generally. And leaders are the ones that are casting a vision for here's where we're going to be tomorrow. And when I say tomorrow, Tim, I literally mean tomorrow, 24 hours from now. But you absolutely can cast a vision for what's going to get done today to be ready for tomorrow. And you can push that horizon out a little bit. We have a little bit of certainty, you know, at least over the next few days. Obviously, in normal times, leaders are looking a lot further out. But why is that so important? Because when leaders paint a compelling vision for the future, it helps lift people out of their present circumstances and helps activate them leaning into the future and moving towards the future. So vision is so important. And yes, there's a time to mourn and grieve and be upset about where we are. But that's what the leader says. But tomorrow, we are working to do this. So that's key is vision for tomorrow. The second key thing, and this is important in all times, is communication. I know we've said it before, Tim. You know, I like to say that Poor communication is at the core of 95% of the failures in marriage and business. And so isolation breaks up communication. It breaks up the natural communications we would have when we would just walk down the hall or walk past the cubicle or meet in the break room, meet in the conference room. So leaders have got to be figuring out what level of communication. And we like to talk about rhythm here. Because it's not good to have just checked in with how were your people doing two weeks ago. Clearly, right now, you've got to continue to be doing that. And you've got to care for people as people, not just as producers of your work. If you're not caring for them in their humanness, because this is a human experience we're having, then you're not caring for your people and you're not communicating with them and checking in with how they're doing. They have fears. They have difficulties. They feel vulnerable, even if they feel safe from the virus, they feel vulnerable financially, economically, and leaders have got to be tapping into that. We actually have just released today, again, this isn't a shameless plug, but it just occurred to me, we just released today a new podcast on good, healthy vulnerability in leaders and unhealthy vulnerability in leaders. So look up five o'clock leadership on whatever your podcast platform is, and you'll hear Brad and I talking about that more. The last thing I would say around communication besides rhythm, I've talked about care, caring for your people. The other C there is obviously you've got to keep challenging your people. And that's the big balance, right? I mean, we can't just say, oh, you don't have to work, you don't have to work, you don't have to work. No, we. that's the great tension in our country right now is being safe against the coronavirus versus being safe economically and financially. And that's a legitimate tension that we're having to work through. Businesses, and Tim, especially a lot of the kinds of businesses that you work with and that I work with are the engine to our economy. And so the challenge has got to be that as soon as we can, we are able to re-engage and get back to work and be generating real money as opposed to just waiting for the government to print more money for us. And so there's got to be that challenge and accountability as hard as it is. But if you balance those two of caring for your people, but also challenging them, good leaders can strike the right balance there based on each person. That's going to help navigate through what we're having to deal with right now. I want to recap that, Rob, because I think you said it very succinctly and powerfully, and that is in times like this, you know, our firm operates off of EOS, which is the Gino Wickham traction system. And, you know, that's got a 10-year, 5-year, 3-year, 90-day vision. We pivoted to 30-day vision. <laughs> and I love your idea, you know, because literally tomorrow, that's my joke now. My other joke in my office is we had three days of the week yesterday, today, and tomorrow. <laughs> and I can remember those three. But you know, that's a great bit of advice for vision for literally tomorrow to help people stay focused because, you know, we are out of control on so many things. And that's probably been the reality of our life anyways, but it's just accentuated now that you can control your decisions and how you respond to your emotions in the moment and do something productive tomorrow. I think the key about communication is, again, cannot be overstated in a time like this. And I know 
we revamped the communication protocol and rhythm and cadence in our firm. And a couple people were a little concerned I had built too robust of a plan. And my attitude has been, and I have not seen anything that has convinced me otherwise, is that you can't communicate enough. I mean, you can obviously create a lot of noise, so you got to be intentionally communicating the right, right message. And I know in our firm, the engagement level with our communications, as much as the number of communications we've done has gone up, so has the engagement. I think it speaks to the fact that people are looking for certainty, they're looking for leadership. And I... You know, the one thing that I've seen myself in my dealings with other business owners is if they're not communicating clearly, they're not being transparent, that is causing some serious problems. And nature abhors a vacuum. In the absence of good information, people will make up stories and they're never positive. So as I say to my team, and I've encouraged some other business owners I know, control the narrative. Take control of the narrative and share what needs to be shared authentically, transparently, and truthfully. It's not a time for sugar plums and fairies. It's time for authentic and no need for fear, but reality. And then the last piece, and this is the one thing about this whole COVID-19 thing, Rob, to me, that's been fascinating. It's obviously a very tragic situation, and it's certainly tragic for those people that are experiencing either, you know, an actual infection and some cases, death, you know, our frontline uh, first responders, medical workers, people in the food services industry that are in harm's way every day and have to go back to their families, not knowing whether they're infected or not. And then for those people that have lost their jobs and or maybe losing them soon or have had their compensation cut or have lost a business, I mean, it's a really tragic time. And at the same time, there is some silver lining in this in my mind, and that is that people seem to be much more in touch with not only their own humanity, but with empathy for one another, caring and concern about their neighbor, you know, their family. And that is, I mean, you nailed it. This is a great time as a leader to pour yourself into just caring for your people. And again, to your point earlier, if you don't care for yourself, you can't care for others. So you got to do both. But uh, really, really appreciate those points. And then the last one is challenging your people. And people want to feel useful right now. They yes. want to feel productive. They want to feel that what they're doing makes a difference and it's contributing in a positive way. So I just I appreciate it. I wanted to recap those because I think as a leader, those are very powerful pointed statements on how you can really truly be a person of impact. And that's what creates great culture. That gets yes. back to your definition. It's what we do around here. And people know they're communicated with authentically and truthfully. They're cared for as humans. They're challenged and given opportunities to contribute. And they have a picture of where they're being asked to go and how they can be a part of that. So cannot thank you enough for how succinctly you put that. I am looking forward to the book. Again, Thanks, Lisa, man. you meant to making the switch from autopilot to intentional. I have listened to your podcast. Five o'clock leadership. I'm looking forward to listening to your episode you and Brad did today because that the one on communication I think was I listened to maybe a week or two ago. And then we will put this in the show notes, but McKinnonCompany.com is where people can find you and your team from a leadership perspective. Any final thoughts, Rob, as we come to a conclusion today? Again, I just commend your leadership, Tim, in making the effort to have this conversation about culture and this conversation, I mean, your podcast in general, it's part of the intentionality around shaping the culture that a leader really wants and a company really wants. And so I commend you for the emphasis you're putting on it. You could be talking about a lot of other things. You could talk about, you know, the wisdom of different financial instruments or where to find a a high interest rate. (laughs) not (laughs) investment right now, but you're choosing this and that just represents your leadership and hats off to you, brother. Way to go. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. We're learning as we go. And ultimately my desire is to help other leaders focus on the culture of their organizations, make the best places to work, create businesses. And I know we do have plenty of listeners that don't own businesses themselves, but I think the key thing that I'm hopeful they take away from these conversations is we're all leaders. 
and yes. you're first a leader of your own life. And secondarily, you can act like a leader even if you don't have the position of it. And you can impact people positively. So we're trying to put out good interviews with people like you of uh, great knowledge and experience to help equip other leaders and individuals to contribute to positive culture. So thank you. It's been uh, a real treat to get to do this together. And uh, I'm looking forward to the time when we can physically get back together again. And I think your project there at the house, I see you've got some things on the floor behind you, maybe finished. <laughs> by the time we are out of stay at home and I'll be able to see the finished product of the house and come see you. And You bet. Day, so. My closing remark, Tim, is remember today is Friday. Yes. Tomorrow is Saturday. And the next day is Sunday. That Saturday and Sunday are typically the weekend. So just a little reminder, everybody's <laughs> losing track of which day it is. So I just wanted to be sure. I, I appreciate the reminder in a funny, strange way. I mean, my workload is not let up at all. And yet I have done a better job of putting boundaries around it, at least. It's just uh, making the time I have for it more intensive. But yes, I've taken to heart, as you know me well for a long time, the need to not go 24 step. So thank you for the reminder <laughs> and the accountability. <laughs> All right, Rob McKinnon, founder and uh, principal of McKinnon Leadership Group. Check out his podcast, Five O'Clock Leadership. Keep an eye out, maybe go on amazon.com now. And I don't know if people can pre-order the book, but they can. Not there quite yet. <laughs> Labor Day 2020. All right, well, sometimes they put the pre-order out there. I didn't know if that was ready yet. Put it on your list. And again, we'll have all the information in the show notes. Thanks a lot, Rob. Great to see Thanks, you. Thanks, Tim.